Welcome to the first and last word poetry series. And tonight we have three incredible writers, Lawrence Kasinich, Annie Pluto, and Peter Philikens. And so Harris will be introducing the readers tonight. And after the reading, we will follow with a short Q and A. So I give you Harris. Thank you, Gloria. And welcome everybody. It's nice to see so many people uh, on Zoom, if not in, in uh, real time. At any rate, um, so, some people tonight are becoming regulars, like my sister's here and uh, a, uh, the first uh, poet laureate of Amesbury is here, um, Elaine Seneschal, Keith, Keith Tornheim, the list goes on. It's, uh, I can name the whole list because I know almost everybody here tonight. <laughs> anyway, let's go with our first uh, feature. Peter Filkins. Um, First, fifth collection of poems called Water and Music, recently uh, released from uh, John Hopkins, uh, UP. His previous collection, uh, The View, uh, were granted, received the 2013 uh, Sheila Margaret Morton uh, Best Book Award from the New England Poetry Club. He teaches writing and literature at Bard College uh, at Simon Rock. And, uh, is a visiting professor at Bard College. So please welcome Peter Wilkins. Thank you, Harris, uh, and thank you, Gloria, and uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for being here. And, and it's a pleasure to to be reading uh, in this series. Uh, I'll be reading from the the new book, Water Music, which has a slash between the. Uh, two words, um, and also features Michael Zelahowski's artwork on the front uh, uh, front cover, uh, which I also used, not the same piece, on my previous book. Um, the reason for the slash <clears throat> is that I, I'm trying to sort of trace the border between uh, uh, culture and nature in the book. And once you're uh, in the realm of culture, obviously in the realm of history and all of uh, the turmoil that it is given to on a, on a daily basis. And the book kind of moves from turmoil, sort of uh, well, the chaos of the uh, most recent history towards uh, a sort of settling within nature. I'm I'm uh, live in the Berkshires on the other side of Massachusetts, and uh, it's a very beautiful place to live. And I uh, actually grew up here as well, so uh, nature has always always been a very sustaining uh, source uh, for me um, and a place uh, uh, that has meant a lot to my poetry. Um, but we begin with culture, and I'll start with a poem in the first section called Augustine's Vision, and this is Saint Augustine. And there were two. Uh, uh, reading a biography of him, there were two uh, facts about his life that stood out at me, um, for me. And one was that Augustine loved uh, cockfighting. He was addicted to it um, and uh, couldn't resist uh, betting money and, and being in the marketplace. And the second one is that the, in the last two weeks of his life, he retreated to his cell and wept. And no one knows why. Um, it was whether it was illness or mental illness or sorrow, being afraid of death, we just don't know. Um, <laughs> Those are two kind of factoids that the poem is built around. Augustine's vision. Many years later, while contemplating beauty as order, he would think of them. Gamecocks digging in their claws for a scrap. And how, in the market's dusty tumult, he felt compelled to stop and watch them while on his way to be baptized and confess himself a creature of sin. Prisoner to his heart's regard, he courted error. The beauty of a thing in and of itself, not always the same as God's invisible plan. The gamecocks and their darting, skillful parries, the exultant crowing, bodies taut with power, soon whipping the crowd into a drunken frenzy. For what horizons do eyes of love not scan, hoping for a hint of reason's beautiful scheme, he later wrote, thinking of savage birds pitched in battle, pure animal action without mind, limp wings and carriage, a croak gone awry, all of it fitting nature's set way. 
Though this was years before he lay on his deathbed, Hippo surrounded, the vandal hordes approaching, himself lamenting his sins, remembering Gamecocks, their beaks and talons bloodied, no doubt convinced a higher mind worked through them, ordering all things as the saint continued weeping in his narrow cell. <clears throat> Turning to a more contemporary subject, uh, this is a poem called Facial Recognition and thinking about the border crisis and the use of fa facial recognition technology to uh, pick up undocumented uh, refugees, immigrants, um, and thinking about that term in a different way, that obviously at some point it would be very possible that anyone uh, arrested or deported would someday recognize the face of the person who arrested or deported them. And the poem kind of turns upon that notion. Facial recognition. When they come for you, you will recognize them by their vacant eyes, imprinted provinces of residual fear, turned cold retaliation, harboring the just barely sustained conviction to deport themselves as legal witnesses who will attest to the mother's heaving collateral sobs, you cuffed and the child, the man who knows you now. It's a poem called Nobody's Road, which speaks to the plague, uh, the disease, uh, the pandemic, if you will, of uh, shootings, mass shootings in this country, and particularly school shootings. Uh, it was um, prodded, I think is the best word, by the shooting at Sandy Hook in 2012. Uh, it's called Nobody's Road. There's actually a road near me uh, called Nobody's Road. And I always thought that was an intriguing uh, name and sort of tucked it away to use in the poem someday. And it seemed fitting uh, for this poem, Nobody's Road. Nobody knows what troubled the kid. Nobody even knew where he lived. Nobody remembers hearing a thing. Nobody considered inquiring. Nobody thought to call the police. Nobody worried it would come to this. Nobody can say how he got inside. Nobody knows yet how many died. Nobody can think of just what to do. Nobody can help but feel deja vu. Nobody agrees how to prevent it. Nobody wants their rights suspended. Nobody can fathom the depth of such grief. Nobody is sure just what to believe. Nobody can undo what has been done. Nobody is watching the neighbor's son. As I say, you can't live in that for too long um, in poetry. You have to sort of find a way out of those kinds of places or spaces. And the book tries to do that. And the second section turns to a more internal processing of, of grief, loss, emotion, um, but sort of moving away from narrative and history. Uh, there's no real setup for these poems. I'll read three of them. Obad. The seagull kiting in a cage of wind navigates again its scry of need. Beyond the docks, the wooden boats, rough barbs buoying flight toward an end to flight and gravity riding the wind. Willow. Amid the toss of light that, that rakes the rust of oak, pearl gray cloud cover bellying rain, the willow lingers, pliant with weeping that is not there and yet is what we know it by, among hemlock, among ash, beside the lake water that laps the rocky shore as a heron unfolds its pageant slate above the surface rippling bruise. Credo, never complain. The jonquils say, blousy with breeze they cannot hold. And the breeze itself, saturated, cold, dispenses torrents, a black cloud drained to quick exhaustion and the marauded plain of jonquils 
blazoned, never complain. The third section turns to back to history, and um, but from a different angle, mainly through the angle of art. Um, there are a couple of elegies to other to poets. There's uh, poems on paintings, uh, and also just sort of more immediate observances of nature and our place within it. Uh, it's a poem called Water Lilies, which meditates upon uh, Claude Monet painting his famous series of water lilies, while. World War I was going on 50 miles just uh, north uh, east of him, and he could hear the bombardment as he painted uh, the, the famous water lily panels uh, in Givani, um, uh, just west of, of Paris in 1917, water lilies. Meanwhile, he painted them. Lilies floating on the surface of a pond he'd constructed for the pleasure of the eye and motifs to paint at century's end. The new one begun with multiple explosions of carmine, coral, white fleshy flowers against the backdrop of a subsurface blue with distances. The sky stretched out upon the watery calm where a cloudy puff would later be captured by his brush in motion. Each day in the studio, another one spent to the echo of guns, bombarding the trenches, pummeling the sum, erupting in billows of char black smoke beyond a horizon no longer present but subsumed, erased, immersed as he was in the flux of light on water, flowers astride turbid shallows beneath a willow and its weeping, our only perspective in a lost world lost to bottomless translucency, the eye that sees it and the intractable sun. Sun Through Snow. Uh, this was written in Ireland actually two years ago, and I was at a writing residency and looked out my uh, window in January and what appeared to be a, a JMW Turner painting, one of his great washes of energy and light. And what it was was a snow squall with the morning light uh, shining through it and immediately sat down to write the poem. It was the only time I have written a poem in real time. That is to say, sat down to write the poem, took me about an hour to draft it and looked up and the squall had just finished. Um, so the poem, the, the moment of the poem coincided with the moment of the event, the event itself. Sun through snow. Turner could have done no better, nor did he, articulating the light made now radiant, prismatic. Hills, lake, trees, and woolen sky filtered by this sun-threaded squall of snow, as real as veneration the smell of rain, the heft of stone, or the thought that within an hour it will be gone. The veer and waft and thrust of clouds and light, electric with the backlit pulse and shimmer of each ray of snow, consigned to memory and weather, closing down this moment's glow. Uh, let's see, I think I'll go, how's my time? Okay, I'll go to a poem called Turtle, uh, which is in the third section, which uh, very much meditates on nature and a lot of animal poems in the third section. Uh, and uh, Turtle was inspired by a, uh, finding a turtle on the back on the back road, a uh, back road in the Berkshires in the spring, moving from one side of the road to another to lay its eggs, of course. And uh, after they do so, they leave them there for weeks um, before they hatch of themselves. Turtle, shy panzer of the swamp, atavistic in your haughty calm, you blink at us encapsulated in our swanky Prius. Crossing the road from the prehistoric world you're going to or coming from to lay your eggs in the sandy bed of tomorrow. Knowing like the dead that however slow it indeed will come. And does, if even if absent of you, sanguine, curmudgeonly, immemorial as mud 
or the memory of mud, propelling you on as you cling to your path through fan-tailed ferns that flood our eyes with green heraldry, fresh and real. And I'll close with uh, two poems, one on the last from the last section, one called Writings, W-R-I-T-I-N-G-S, which reflects on uh, swallows in the morning, a summer morning, uh, spinning over the, of the, over the lake uh, where I live in, the, uh, in Western Massachusetts. Writings, swallows at daybreak, pure in violet sounds, the flit and sputter of their antic rounds across lake glass, dipping their tails mid-flight and lambent, translucent inkwells left pooled and pooling toward the outer shore, a water pocked trail, their signature. And finally, the last poem in the, in the collection is simply called Envoy. Uh, it's really, I think of it as a poem about driving. I drive a lot to commute to both Simon's Rock and Bard College, and it's dedicated to my poet friend, Abbott Cutler, who also uh, drove a lot in his career to, to teach and sort of reflects on all the time we've spent doing that. Envoy, a burl of light on a pane glass window, cold drizzle, wet snow, eruptive weather. And this, our only legacy, to know the low hung cloud that glances off a mirrored surface, yet more real than the cloud itself. Muddy April, indecisive to the last, mimicking the slap of wipers back and forth across the slope of windshield, or oddly, at the corner of Maine and North, that storefront window, reflecting now the curve of heaven, the noxious exhaust, pedestrians astride the polished glass, the cars rolling by, the dog on its leash. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, that was good. excellent. I love the presentation and the, and the mix of your subjects. Thank you very much. Another warm round of applause, please, for Peter Filkins. Thank you all. Thank that was you. great. That was, that was superb. So our next uh, poet uh, to be reading will be uh, somebody who almost needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway. Um, Lawrence Kessenich, among his many uh, achievements and attributes, uh, won the 2010 Strokestown International Poetry Prize in Ireland. And it, it was uh, quite weighty. I think it was about 7,500 pounds. And um, at any rate, um, his poetry has been published in uh, Suwannee Review, uh, Atlanta Review, uh, Poetry Ireland Review, and many other magazines. Uh, he has two poetry chapbooks, uh, Pearl and Strange News, and two full-length poetry books, uh, Before Whose Glory in Age of Wonders. Lawrence is also um, the um, highly acclaimed uh, managing editor uh, one of two of Ibsen Street. So oh, please welcome Lawrence Hesnick. Thank you, Harris. And thank you and Gloria for having me uh, to read tonight. Uh, since we're on the cusp of summer here, I thought I'd start with a couple of my favorite summer poems to set everybody up for it. Um, this one is called Emergency Call, and it's based on a little news bit I saw on a screen in an elevator, believe it or not. And here is what it said. An Oregon woman was arrested for misusing 911 when she called and asked for the cutest cop I've ever seen to return to her house. <laughs> Emergency Call. 
If that wasn't an emergency, I'd like to know what is. 10 months without sex, the kids at camp, a hot summer day smelling of tanning oil and white flowers when this God appears, all black curls and blue eyes, his incandescent smile melting my legs like ice cream. There really was an intruder poking around in the backyard, but my God found nothing disturbed except me mooning at him like a lovesick cow. And then he was leaving me saying, don't hesitate to call again if need be. And so I did. Perhaps I should have mentioned the intruder again, but he was long gone from my mind, replaced by muscles, blue cotton, and a smile that wouldn't quit. This next one is based on a lovely evening I had with my family up in um, uh, Burlington, Vermont. And it's called Existentialism Revisited because it kind of, uh, in college, I had kind of had a depressing, uh, when I studied existentialism, I became extremely depressed. And this is kind of the opposite end of that spectrum. Full of Mexican food and margaritas, at sunset, we wandered down to a public dock overlooking Lake Champlain. The Adirondacks across the still water, one rank behind the other, like cardboard mountains in a children's play, turn blue and pink and gray as the sun descends. Below pleasure boats dock at a lakeside restaurant, a toddler in red shorts clatters across the weathered gray planks and a terrier sits alert at the foot of his master's deck chair. Sailboats, sails reefed, glide into the harbor, running lights aglow like candles floating down a river. I inhale the pleasing scent of lake water. My daughter rests her pretty head on my shoulder while my son folds himself to lean on the railing and gaze out at the light show on the horizon. Redolent air cups us in its gentle palm as if we were precious jewels. And who's to say we are not? Our consciousness graces this planet. We are the eyes of God, the consumers of creation. And if we sometimes gorge ourselves on the feast, who can blame us? The eyes see, the ears hear, the fingers touch, the nose smells, the tongue tastes. Most importantly, the heart feels, welling up like a late summer watermelon, pink, ripe, fat with the sweet juice of existence. So on a more serious note, of course, we've all been a little more aware of racism, I think, in the last year than we've ever been. And, uh, for me, that harks back to my own experience watching the development of the civil rights movement in the 60s. And after watching a show about the Freedom Riders, um, I wrote this poem. It was in response to a, a white woman who was on there uh, who was involved in one of these events, which will become clear in the poem. It's called Daddy's Girl, Anniston, Alabama, Mother's Day, 1961. When her daddy leaves for his store next to their house, he says the Freedom Riders are coming through, but he and the boys have prepared a little surprise. Right after church, laughing men begin to gather on the gravel in front of the store. She knows most of them, but they don't seem themselves. It is as if they've donned hyena masks, laughter curling back their lips to reveal sharp canines. She keeps her distance as she would from a pack of dogs. When the bus appears around the bend, a wild roar goes up. Startled, she drops the bottle she's using to nurse her doll on the stoop. Something tells her to go inside, but she fights it, sets down her doll, walks to the edge of the gravel as the bus crunches in on slashed tires. What happens next? unravels across her mind like silent movie clips, jerky, 
grainy, hard to credit as real, glass shattering, flames spurting, smoke billowing, blacks and whites stumbling from the bus, doubled over, coughing, crying, water. That single word snaps her back to reality, to human beings beaten down by her father and his friends, crawling across gravel to the soft grass of her yard, still crying, water. Next thing she knows, she's in the kitchen, pulling a tall glass from the blonde cabinet, filling it to the brim, sloshing water on the floor in her hurry to get back. She goes straight to a black woman in a pale pink dress lying on her side, sets the water on the grass before her, goes back for more. Soon all the glasses from her mother's set dot the lawn, glinting like sun rays through breaking clouds after a brutal storm. Exhausted, numb, she goes to her room, collapses on the bed, cries until her heart aches, knowing she will never be her daddy's girl again. So I do like these, these items that I get in newspapers or in various little places where there are bits of news and this one's a little more entertaining. Um, when he ran out of jurors for a trial, an Ohio judge sent sheriff's deputies to the local Walmart to issue summonses to surprised shoppers called checkout justice. I was standing at the checkout counter at the grocery section, my hand extended for change when the deputy slapped the summons into it, grinning like a frat boy playing a practical joke. Others were served over watermelon or along with a pound of burger at the deli counter. 20 of us were led to an old school bus allowed only to put our groceries in our cars, leaving lettuce to wilt in its bag, ice cream to melt into soup. Like criminals, we could make one call. I told my wife to eat lunch without me if she could find anything in the refrigerator. The deputies informed us it was a big trial that if chosen, we might be sequestered. I thought of bananas wadding in my trunk. The judge was a bilious old man with pastry crumbs down the front of his robe. He whipped the lawyers with his sharp voice until they chose enough shoppers to fill out the jury. And then it was over for those of us not chosen, dropped back at the Walmart lot it was as if we'd stepped outside for a long cigarette break. We could have continued shopping all night if we'd wanted to, but who knew where we might end up if we dawdled at the dairy case or took too long to grind our coffee. Um, this is another one which really kind of blew me away. As soon as I read it, I knew I had to write something about this. This was in the Boston Globe. And it said that China is cracking down on the use of strippers at rural funerals to attract more attendees. The poem is called Making the Dead Rise. Mr. Yuan was not as popular as some of his neighbors required a bevy of lithe young women to fill out his funeral party. The men came from miles around to honor his name with rice beer and cheers for the nearly naked bodies writhing on the Yuan's makeshift stage. His wife cried quietly in a shed behind the house for Mr. Mr. Yuan had had a penchant for younger women long before the grave. Still, it was important to honor his memory with a large number of guests. And it was a new China, a nation of capitalists and lechers. And wasn't there an old saying about catching flies with honey? So shameless women gyrated their honey pots on stage, causing the honored Mr. Yuan to beat on the lid of his coffin, begging to be released. But his drunken guests, deafened by music and lust, heard only a drumbeat coming from somewhere far away. So 
Well, as I get a little older, I think of death a little more often myself and occasionally have an experience that uh, reminds me of it. And this is one of them. It's called Dead Possum in Fall. Except for the thin trail of blood from his mouth, he looks serene, as if thinking, as G.B. Shaw wanted written on his tombstone, I knew if I hung around long enough, something like this would happen. One second he was crossing a road, the next he was dead. One second is all that separates me, my warm blood, my firmly beating heart, my legs churning to get me across the road from death from the end of fall foliage lighting up my eyes, wood smoke seducing my nose, cool air caressing my damp, damp lip, excuse me, cool air caressing my damp wrists, my wife's voice greeting me back home. It is almost unbearable to imagine it all being gone in an instant. Everything I cling to torn from my hands with death's indifferent glee. As I trot on, each fallen leaf demands my love before I'm swept away. And another thing, of course, that we're afraid is dying is our, our world um, environmentally, or maybe just us, but we'll see. And this poem uh, is about that subject. It's called Evolution. When we are gone, the vines that coil dead trees will claim our furniture and our flagpoles. This river, which has flowed for millennia, will flow for millennia more, running freely to the sea. The geese that float upon its waters will swim more easily without the wakes of powerboats, without dodging the effluvia of civilization, plastic bags, styrofoam, broken bottles, our buildings will crumble like stale cakes. The wounds we've slashed into the patient earth will heal and the wind will blow frictionless across our history. If I end with something a little more upbeat, this poem makes me think of the way people are, um, you know, literally or metaphorically uh, tossing their masks in the uh, air at least here in Massachusetts, where there are enough people uh, vaccinated that uh, people can be out without them. Um, this is called Holiday. Flowers break their moorings, float above treetops, intertwine, dance, show off their petals like preening birds. In the street, Women kick off heels, roll down pantyhose, fling jackets into the gutter. Men shed coats, strip off ties, wave them like colorful pennants streaming from sailboat masts. Young children take it in stride, fill their eyes with yellows, reds, oranges, magentas. Teenagers mistrust this upside down world, resent the adults usurping their prerogative to misbehave. Though bars are empty, intoxication reigns. Street vendors spout poetry, cops pull rabbits out of their hats, choruses of construction workers sing from girders. When twilight comes, the party ends abruptly as if the sun were a magician folding up his axe. The flowers drift to earth, drop onto the grass like exhausted lovers. Thank you. Okay, we should have Harris back on momentarily. Thank you so much for the wonderful reading so far. Just glorious. Harris, you're on. You have to unmute, Harris. Ooh. 
Oops. Did we lose him? Harris, we lost you. <laughs> Your picture and you. I have no fear. This will all go out and post edit. I'm just running it around my mind right now. Okay, I'm going to do that. Then I have to do that. Um, so don't worry about it. You can dance with Glee. Okay, I will introduce Annie um, while Harris is um, trying to get um, He's there now. Uh, I got it. Well, you got it. Okay, it's all yours, Harris. Yeah, finally. That's okay. Finally. Okay, sorry about all that. <laughs> I had a little technical difficulty here. Okay, so <laughs> sorry for that delay. Um, that consider that a station identification break. Um, okay, so Anna Elizabeth uh, Pluto grew up in Brooklyn, New York, before it was cool to be from Brooklyn. She's professor of literature and theater at Lesley University in Cambridge, Mass., where she is the artistic director of the Oxford Street Players. The latest book is The Deepest Part of Dark, Unlikely Stories Press, uh, NOLA. Um, I believe she's also the co-editor of Nix's Mate. And uh, please welcome Annie Pluto. Thank you, Harris. Thank you all. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, Gloria for inviting me. And uh, Peter and Lawrence, I don't think I'm ever gonna get out of my mind the image of St. Augustine and the cockfights and Mr. Juan banging on the lid of his, of his coffin as the strippers dance there. That, that is, that's great. <laughs> so I'm going to read um, <clears throat> some poems that are, uh, they're new, basically. This is all written in the last year. So uh, as uh, my bio said, I was from Brooklyn before it was cool. So the neighborhood I grew up in is Flatbush, but parts of it are now called Ditmas Park. So this is called Flatbush, now Ditmas Park. These are all the houses that we didn't grow up in, addresses where they even had a breakfast room and a black maid who made the breakfast. The lunch is packed in tight Barbie boxes and dinner too before taking the train at Newkirk Avenue and going home to her own family where she did it all again. These are the houses where I stood in awe, waiting at the door for the birthday party tour. The mothers smart in brand new dresses, their Friday night beauty parlor tresses the background fathers suited up and handling out the pointed hats, the pinching elastic under the chin. Happy birthday, let me in. These are the houses that sandwiched in my dead end street, the uneven place where the neighborhood and the train did meet. I'm working on a series of uh, poems from photographs and uh, this is my childhood friend, Lisa Levine, uh, she's a photographer. Uh, you can look her up and uh, the name of these, the series is called No Place Like Home. So this one is called Bensonhurst, which is a neighborhood in Brooklyn, 2012. Nestled in the quiet on the perpetual half shell of Venus, goddess, mother, you wear blue in Brooklyn front yards, away from the street and the pounding of feet. White rabbit Easter Sunday is always busy. The wrought iron fence is meant to cage me in, but my hands are open and my head is bowed. I am not allowed to tell you that I am a Jew and hath not a Jew eyes to see the perpetual flowers that come to the vase cemented in concrete, filled on the holidays to show someone is remembering their dead. I am too, my son, my son, my beautiful son. So these poems all have uh, references to the 
to the Virgin Mary or Mary, the mother of Jesus, and um, the statues that you have Mary on the half shell. Uh, this one's called Mary Light in Texas. She's come over the border in full cover, in white carrying along the scent of roses and corn. She's wearing snakes around her ankles and throwing pomegranate seeds along the river. She's found her predecessor Venus and taken refuge in the half shell light of a full Texas moon. She's guarding the houses, the women, and all of the children who've passed on too soon. And uh, this one is called Sandy Texas Candy House. And again, it's from one of Lisa Levine's photographs. Where the gingerbread tastes like baked afternoon sun and Mary walks the room silent as a nun, the sun pours through the pink curtain sheet there's a tear in the eye of the Virgin. A smudge in the fuchsia lipstick she wore to her first prom. All the sad hot years later, she's made him cover the glider to a match lit to remembrance. A saint's candle purchased at the flea market on Clovis. Inside, where they still sell Coca-Cola in green glass bottles from old Mexico where she wanders and watches the lady who sells parakeets neatly lined up in their happy cages singing. And she wonders why that doesn't happen in the Sandy, Texas candy house. And this is another one from that series. It's called St. Francis meets Mary Kay at the Prairie Pink Barbie Dream House. The Virgin doesn't live here, but her animals do. The donkey she rode into Bethlehem, the sheep that surrounded the manger, the cattle that brought her warmth during labor without a midwife or her mother, Saint Anne. Her bewildered husband betrothed to a pregnant girl who walked with a circle of stars at her feet, desiring pomegranates and charming the snakes in Nazareth. St. Francis has come here to the Texas heat, his tonsured statue, always holding that girl's son in his arms. The animals, they come in pairs and kick up dust, the pink house as tight as sex, as a womb ready to burst, its blood and bones alive and trembling. This next one's called Circle of Stars. And um, I live in Roslindale, Massachusetts with my husband. And there is a Russian Orthodox Church on South Street. And I was actually I was baptized in the Russian Orthodox Church. And this church has no name on it. Um, so anyway, this is, this is about this church, Circle of Stars. The yellow church and onion domes recall the turbans severed heads of the last Kazan Tatars, victory at Astrakhan, ornate as blood itself. In Moscow, every red square picture postcard parade marches past St. Basil's 4,500 miles and the summer apart. The yellow church is closed. The young priest quizzes my baptism. I cannot recall the name but the copper dome rises above the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, the transfiguration, the annunciation, the dormition of the beautiful Mary. Say her name and she will open the oak doors and step in red and green, in gold gently between her circle of stars. Come in, come in, come in and light your candle. Come in and I, will handle him. And this um, is a poem that was going to go in um, uh, my book, uh, The Deepest Part of Dark, but I decided to pull it. So I'll read it. It's called Simple People. When my mother died and they were both safely buried, you wrote a Facebook message 
what passed for deceitful condolence, making sure I understood that they were simple people. What you saw was what you got. Dear cousin, how you must have waited in aching decades to descry your displeasure, the sins of the parents revisited on the grieving daughter. Let me respond now that I have waited five years, appropriate in the Orthodox Church. Let me summon up a clean slate, a fine pen, and let's move backwards. This is my Rashomon tale. You left home to join your oldest sister in San Francisco, returned unmarried with a child. I was 13 to your 18 years, my parents' greatest fear. My father sat me in the kitchen and threatened to kill me if I ever came home pregnant. We won't discuss we'll what I have given up. I'm sorry, what happened? Hello? Can you guys hear me? Yes? Yes. Oh. You're fine. I'm, I don't know what that was. I don't know. Oh, well, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll start again. All right, simple people. When my mother died and they were both safely buried, you wrote a Facebook message what passed for deceitful condolence, making sure I understood that they were simple people. What you saw was what you got. Dear cousin, how you must have waited in aching decades to descry your displeasure, the sins of the parents revisited on the grieving daughter. Let me respond. Now that I have waited five years, appropriate in the Orthodox Church, let me summon up a clean slate, a fine pen, and let's move backwards. This is my Rashomon tale. You left home to join your oldest sister in San Francisco, returned unmarried with a child. I was 13 to your 18 years, my parents' greatest fear. My father sat me in the kitchen and threatened to kill me if I ever came home pregnant. We won't discuss what I have given up. You did fine, your son even better. 30 years later at a family reunion, invited as the outside relation, when I met his father, an aging hippie, long in the tooth with his dowdy wife, I tried to picture who he was when you were 17 and beautiful. My mother comforted your grandmother as she stumbled through the farmhouse, keeling from icon to icon, visiting the Catholic holy pictures too, the embroidered blessed kitchen virgin, the dining room Via Dolorosa, the black Madonna of Czestochowa, all of your great shame having ruined the family name. They were your judges, waited for your falling. They were hardly simple. They navigated their world, speaking three languages fluently. My mother wore her American birthright as jewelry. My father proud to be the same. Your name was not ruined. They were as secretive as death, silent in misfortune. I defended you and you never knew. It's my little secret, dear cousin, four times removed. You've had your vengeance and now I've had mine too. And I will end with a, um, a different kind of poem. This was written last year for the anniversary of the moon landing. So it's called A Man on the Moon. Perhaps we never landed on the moon, says Mr. Lasing, listing. The lack of craters near the landing site. The lunar surface looks undisturbed. The lack of stars and other optical anomalies. Illusions. NASA sent the astronauts into orbit, much like the International Space Station, and returned them in eight days when the command console separated from the vehicle and descended to Earth, as of course was shown in films. Eight days, the number of the infinite, the magus, the god players, the rocket builders without the technical expertise to put a man on the moon, a man on the moon. The silent Buzz Aldrin and the Saturn V, the flag waving rig to a curtain rod to give the illusion of wind on the moon, the force of gravity being about one sixth of what it is on earth. It might've floated away 
made its way home as a stick of shreds and patches in the mouth of the Soviet ghost dog Laika. I watched the black and white TV in the small parlor where we spent little time. The room was summer hot and the moon, a silver white sand snow surface for the astronauts, the flag, the summer I was 11. I believed in space, in rockets, and a man on the moon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Annie. Um, now we're open to questions and answers. Does anyone have any questions for our readers? Uh, you'll have to unmute yourself and just ask. I can't see everybody. Um, uh, Brenda, you have your hand up. Just unmute. I just want to make a, a, a lovely comment to you all. Um, I got a cold for the first time since before the pandemic, and it was awful. <laughs> but I'm feeling better today, and I feel even better now. The three of you were just wonderful this evening. Um, I, I will never think of the water lilies again without thinking about World War I. Lawrence, you made me laugh at almost every one, <laughs> and, and you were just spectacular. Um, thank you. Thank you all for being healing therapy for me. <laughs> thank you, Brenda. Um, anyone else? Uh, just please unmute yourself and ask. I am on a big screen, so I can't see everyone. Harris, go ahead. <laughs> I, I was waiting to, so I want to step on anybody's toe to, or as eager as I am to uh, comment. Um, again, uh, it was three, three remarkable posts tonight. I do have a question um, of all of you. Uh, any one of you may choose to answer or not answer. Don't feel obligated to answer, but I'd like to hear if you could, all of you. Uh, if you had one poem that you want to be remembered for, uh, I don't know if it, if it was included in tonight's readings or uh, in one of your collections, which one would it be and why? Annie, go ahead. <laughs> Um, it, it, I didn't read it tonight. It's a called I Have Been to Samarkand. And it's in, um, I believe it's in two books of mine. It's about my father's World War II journey and um, his moving towards his death. But that's the poem I'd want to be remembered by. I spent a lot of time writing it and researching the places. And when I finally had it, I was very happy about it. So, Thank you. I, I'll, I'll answer Harris to, I'll be a little bit witty to say, and, and the, the, the really honest answer is the next one I write. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but I guess if I had to think, I think uh, in my last book, there's an elegy for my sister who passed away at 42 um, in her sleep. And it came about, it's called Marking Time. And uh, it came about... I think elegies for siblings are very hard, difficult to write um, because it's usually unnatural that siblings die uh, uh, early. Uh, you know, I, there's all kinds of elegies for parents, um, uh, God forbid, you know, children. Um, and it took me about five years to try to figure out how to write or, or even to think of how to write the poem. And I was teaching Tintern Abbey which I love, and which of course is the greatest brother-sister poem in, in the language. And I realized I had a different relationship to Tintern Abbey than I had ever had before uh, because of my sister's passing. And uh, so this poem, Marking Time, lifts all kinds of lines uh, from Tintern Abbey and kind of uh, mimics Tim Tintern Abbey. And, and, uh, and every time I read it, I, I pretty much just about lose it. It's, uh, it's the poem that moves, moves me the most. Thank you. Thank you. 
I think uh, actually, I mean, there are a couple, but but um, the one I read tonight, Existentialism Revisited, uh, I really love because uh, it captures, well, partially it captures, uh, well, it doesn't really talk about the earlier part except in the title, but the movement in my life from being pretty depressed about the world to really feeling a great deal of gratitude about it. And I think that poem, it was, it was just a magical evening. And that poem really captured what I was feeling that night. Um, and it's, a, it's an attitude toward the world that I would love to bequeath to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have a quick question for Anne, and that is, why did you take the poem out of the book? It's such a, such um, a oh, yeah. Poem. I know that's what my publisher said, because I get along, there are three sisters in that family and I get along very well with two of them. And mm -hmm. I thought they'll probably buy the book and then they'll see this poem and mm -hmm. it's just not worth it. So I have to send it somewhere. It's just not worth it. You know, it's, I'll send it somewhere and, and this person will never find it and she'll never look so, but the other two would, so mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm extended family even, I mean, really extended. I just wanted to thank you all for enriching my day with your exquisite poetry and enriching the entire poetry community. Mm -hmm. It's just such a joy to be among so many creative and talented people and just nice folks. It, speak of extended families, Annie, what I couldn't have dreamed in my best dreams of having such an incredible extended family as the one in the community of poetry. It's just, um, thank you. Mm -hmm. Please keep writing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Especially during these times, and it's pretty yes. remarkable. Those of us who joined writing groups and you know put out magazines and went to readings, it's been pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, I don't have a question, Harris. I, I wish I did, but I have a couple of comments. One generally, I am very, very impressed with the very wide range of what these three different excellent poets choose to look at and turn into poetry. Uh, it, it's very different to hear each voice but they're all so interesting and they say things about things I might not have thought about how to put things together in that particular way. So that's my comment. And my more specific comment is to Annie about the poem. And I hope I'm not misremembering it. The poem that talks about the shame of girls who get pregnant when they shouldn't. And that's pretty much a neglected subject. And it's a very important one because mm -hmm. it's a hidden thing. And I think it's great when poems bring things out of their hiding places and make people look at it and think about it and think about the harms that shame does to people who are pretty much innocent of the circumstances that overcome them or happen to them which could be any kind of circumstance of love, desire, wanting, not wanting, running away. What are all the circumstances that we can get shamed for and blamed for that we didn't choose? And I really respect that poem and thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Anyone else have a question or comment? Okay, so then I guess we will close out tonight. Um, Hello. Harris, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I just, I don't mean to interrupt. I want to give a, a, another warm round of applause for all three wonderful features tonight. Peter Filkins, Lawrence Kessenick, and Annie Pluto. Bravo, bravo, and bravo. And thank you. And I want to thank everybody who came tonight and who shared our experience of this wonderful poetry. So thank you all. And 
I'm going to sneak in a special shout out to my amazing sister, Brenda, who, despite her being under the weather, made it again to uh, uh, continue an unbroken uh, support of our poetry series. Thank and you. also to a special person in the audience, Michael Casey, uh, who's a, a, a Yale younger poet and an amazing, authentic voice in poetry with several collections to his credit. So I, I gave shout outs to people earlier, so I'm not gonna go through the whole audience, but I could. <laughs> so thank you all for coming and back to you, Gloria. I just wanna say, Gloria, it's great to see you back. We missed you. Oh, thank you. That's very sweet of you. And um, Harris really said it. So thank you everyone for being here tonight. And uh, we'll see you next month, the uh, third Tuesday of July. And thanks again, everyone. And thank you, Harris and RJ. And thank you to the readers and good night. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you, Harris. Thank you, Gloria, Annie. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye.